My name is Max. I'm Kevin. Welcome to another Six Patterns video. It's been a while. It has. Summertime. Everybody likes to leave Arizona in the summertime. And people like to go on vacation in general. That's true. Get out of the heat or get out of your normal routine. Yeah. Yeah. We'd love to do that, but we're here in Arizona and we just suffer indoors with air conditioning. Yeah. But we shouldn't complain. We do have sunshine every day. That's true. And you can still get in your bathing suit and go outside. Okay. So the big issue here is how to approach the peripheral lung nodule. And sometimes you'll be faced with a transbronchial biopsy in this situation. And it can be tricky. But in this case, I think they targeted the lesion from the outside, went through the chest by radiology. For sure. Yeah, percutaneous, per percutaneous needle core biopsy, peripheral lung nodule. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And the beautiful thing about a needle core biopsy is you already know the clinical history. Right. I didn't have to tell you this old man had a lung nodule right. because we know they're targeting something. If it's got a core, they went for something they could see that was a localized lesion on imaging. And so the most important step is to make sure you can explain the mass lesion that they were supposedly biopsied. Right. So if we were to think for a moment, what would this section of the core look like under the radiology imaging studies? Would it be black like normal lung or would it be opaque? White. It'd be white. Which is interesting because the solid tissue, in this case mainly pink, is scar. True. Sometimes the solid tissue is pure cellularity, so it's blue. But here, most of this we see on the screen is pink. So I've, we've got solid areas, and I think even though that's only a millimeter and a half, two millimeters, three millimeters maybe, uh, in a section of core, I think we are looking at a lesion that was identifiable on imaging. For sure. I mean, I think we can say with confidence they hit the lesion they were going after. Now, could you say that, Max, if you looked at that core that's in the upper right corner? The upper right-hand corner might be a little bit more difficult. Certainly, this would look opaque. But that's the, a tiny On the imaging thing. studies, but yeah. it's so small, you would probably think it's just a little vessel, a little bronchovascular bundle. So, I think with this core, you wouldn't be quite as sure. But right. this core... I it's think much when you look at everything together, yeah. you feel confident they hit a lesion, yep. and perhaps it was the lesion they were going after. Right. So we've accomplished the first big step, yeah. and that's confirming that they actually hit got the, what the they target. were aiming for, yeah. not the old swing and a miss, yep. which does happen. Okay, so what do we have here? If we look a little bit more closely, something we all recognize? Lung. Lung. Benign lung or malignant lung? That looks benign. That looks benign, I agree. And then we move over here to abnormalities. Yeah. And the abnormalities consist of? This kind of loose scar tissue and uh, looks like glandular structures. And these glandular structures don't look like normal lung structure. Now, that's a hard thing to say because when the lung gets scarred, sometimes the glandular structures get trapped in it which makes this a really difficult case. For sure. I wouldn't show the easy cases. No, of course you wouldn't. Those you just dispense with in two seconds. Of course. This is one you have to study. So we've determined that they hit the target, and the target has an abrupt edge, at least in some of the cores. For sure. An abrupt edge here, and actually even in this other core, All right. we still have a fairly abrupt transition between benign lung here. Yeah. This is key. This is a key feature. And we can't emphasize this enough. When, you, when you're looking at the interface between an abnormality on a core biopsy and the surrounding lung, is it a sliding transition or is it abrupt? Tumors tend to have abrupt edges. Inflammatory things tend to slide into normal lung. A great differentiating point between inflammatory reactive conditions on needle core and malignant conditions on needle core. The abrupt transition. So clue number one. Sharp edge. Okay, so now that we think we're dealing with a malignancy. Or a neoplasm of some kind. Or a neoplasm of some, t some kind. Now we can look and interrogate the cytology a little bit more. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but this is a little bit of a peculiar cytology. Yeah. Hobnail cells, lining spaces. Incredibly hobnailed and sloughing off. Yeah. They're 
this cohesive. Yeah. Some of them are showing windows. Yeah. In the cytoplasm. Look at that. Windows in, in between, between the cells. The cells too. Yep. They're rounding up. Normal epithelial cells don't usually round up like that. Right. So if you looked at this quickly with us and said, you know, I hear you guys talking about funny looking cells, but I don't know if I'm going to pull a trigger on that cytologically. Not ready to go to malignancy? I mean, it's not an obvious one. Somebody would say, maybe, maybe you put all the pieces together and you get there. But on an individual cell, the overlap between highly reactive pneumocytes and low-grade malignant pneumocytes is it, something that's debated and has been debated for decades. And I think the only way you're going to get to the solution is to put all the pieces together. We looked at clue one. We looked at clue two. Sloughing of epithelial cells with relatively high NC ratios. In other words, they're not all just lining spaces. They actually seem to be budding off the lining into the uh, space they're adjacent to. Exactly. So that's clue number two. And here's a great comparison. Yeah. Benign appearing pneumocytes. With some reactive type 2 cells. With some reactive change to these more infiltrative cells. And what would you say about the stroma in this particular area? It looks like fibromyxoid. It doesn't look like any normal lung structure. Almost desmo. Plastic, yeah, yeah, right. So interesting. The, that stroma, that fun, funny, loose desmoplastic stroma, and the shape of these glandular structures, I think that's another clue, important clue to getting to a diagnosis of cancer in this case. Neoplasm, in this case. I would go all the way. I would say I've seen enough here that I'm convinced this is an adenocarcinoma. That sort of reticulated growth of interconnected glandular structures, it just doesn't happen as a reactive phenomenon. I agree. Totally neoplastic, right? Desmoplasia, irregular growth patterns, etc. But what if I told you this man also had a pleural effusion? Okay, so it gets us back to the obvious. Conclusion we make when we see gland-like structures in the lung is it must be a glandular tumor. The sloughing of cells can be seen both in adenocarcinomas and other tumors. True. The growth into the lung like this and the formation of a mass, even with a pleural fusion, argue against mesothelioma. But you have to think about it. And if you tell me, I don't know this case, but if you tell me that the markers were those of mesothelioma, I might say, okay, I'm buying it. There's some solid areas of this mesothelioma. It's also growing on the pleura. Right. So what markers would you typically get? Are you going to work up adeno versus meso? I just want, I'll tell you right now, I want a TTF1 and I like a CK7. I think we too often neglect that. Um, they're great defining antibodies to start with. I agree. I usually go two markers for adenocarcinoma, two markers for mesothelioma. It's always good. It's always reasonable. And yeah. all, other than chasing it over a week where you get a couple and you get a couple, you might as well get a core group that's going to help right. distinguish. And if you're going to be sitting on a stand in a jury situation yeah. trying to testify why you called it mesothelioma, it's always nice to have more than one marker. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So TTF in this case actually is negative. Wow. CK7 is positive. Yeah. WT1, mesothelioma marker, positive. Nuclear. Nuclear staining, okay. positive. Calretinin, strong positivity. Nuclear and cytoplasmic. Cytokeratin 5.6. Cytokeratin 5.6, positive. Wow. You've got a lot of immunohistochemical data telling you that this is not adenocarcinoma, and yet it's forming gland like structures. Which mesothelioma does. Which mesothelioma certainly can do. So would you do a mucin stain? I'm not certain a mucin stain would be helpful in this particular situation, but it would be negative. See how high tech stain. we are in the U.S.? We don't even pay attention to simple things like a mucin stain. It would be unusual to have a mucin droplet here. 
There are some vacuoles in the cytoplasm. That's true. I don't know what you'd do with it, though. You might say it's a mesothelium with mucin. With mucin production. Right. It's been reported. Yeah. Yeah. So this case is a great pitfall case to keep in the back of your mind. When you're dealing with a needle core, it's very easy to say, oh, we've got glandular structures, they're infiltrative pattern. This is clearly an adenocarcinoma. I'm going to preserve tissue from molecular studies. I'm not going to get immunohistochemical stains. But the reality is, is that sometimes, particularly when you have a little bit of an unusual history like pleural effusion, which can happen in both conditions, but you have this discohesive cytology, the windows in between the cells. Relatively bland. Relatively cytologic bland cytologic features. You should consider the possibility of a mesothelioma and get the work up. I agree. I think this is a fantastic case to illustrate that. I think we could assume that if he only has a solitary lesion, it has to be pleural based. Exactly. Now, sometimes peripheral nodules are solitary parenchymal nodules. In that case, I think mesothelioma will be very low on your differential. If it's pleural based and there's a pleural effusion, if you went back to the CT, you might find there's also pleural thickening. A thickened pleura, a rind that's five, six millimeters in thickness, a core biopsy will make it look just like this. Exactly. Exactly. And notice that it's hard to tell on this. We don't know where the pleural surface is. Right. We can't really tell because this is an infiltrative mass forming neoplasm. And it fragmented into a bunch of pieces too, which makes it even harder. Very true. Okay. So is there anything else you need to do on this? Any molecular studies? Uh, for mesothelioma, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think so either. Do you care about BAP1 in this setting? <laughs> I really don't. Do you I care about we... MTAP in this setting? We already made the decision. Homozygosity for P16 in this setting? <laughs> I mean, we could just make some more money. Yeah, yeah, but it's not helpful. So I, I think getting to the decision, regardless of what we call it in the end, that we think it's infiltrative, that it has abrupt transitions, that the cytology is beyond the pale for reactive, I think we've done the really hard work on this case, and then order some stains, and have a, a constant battery that you always use. And you choose what the battery is, but have a few antibodies for mesothelioma, a few antibodies for... Have it be consistent. Exactly. Right? So you will always approach the case the same. Same one every time. Well, I hope you enjoyed this case. I hope you learned something. Don't forget to comment and like below. And we'll see you around for the next one. All right. Thanks, Max.